And so I, I'm still looking forward. And many thanks for Ashik to organize this uh, seminar. And uh, as Ashik said, I have done some work in China about urban villages. And I think uh, Bangladesh is going through a fast stage of urbanization. Maybe some of the experiences in China we observed could be some lessons for, for you guys. And before I say that, I, Taiji and Taiji, Taiji and Ashik both are my very capable PhDs, and I I'm, feel very proud of their achievement. And so I, I hope to work with them for quite a long time in the future as well. So probably I'll just go through this slide I prepared. And this is the outline, and I'll give a quick overview of urbanization and urban transformation in China. China is a huge country, and probably I can't go through many of the details. I just get, give a quick overview of what do we mean by urbanization in China and how fast the country has been urbanized. And secondly, I will use Shenzhen as an example. Shenzhen is China's first special economic zone next door to Hong Kong. And it started the fast urbanization process, industrialization process in China as well. And within Shenzhen, one of the quite important phenomena is the so-called urban villages. And urban villages in China it means the traditional rural villages, when the city grows bigger, they become part of the city, but they remain some of the traditional features of the villages. And you will see from the talk, but there's many of them, they have played a quite important role in the urbanization process. So I, I, I will give a bit more information on the urban villages towards the later part. So urban development in China, it is quite important policy and phenomena in, in the country since the 1950s. I mean, you probably know that China was taken over by the communists in 1949. And in the 1950s, China was quite good friend with the USSR. So many USSR experts was helping in China and in relation to urban development and industrialization. So that period, it's a planned period of urban development. Cities develop very fast, mainly in the inland areas, away from the border, away from the coast area, which used to be influenced by colonial power, partly for regional balances and partly for defense reasons new industries were all relocated uh, uh, in the inland areas. Places like Xi'an, where I came from, was the first major industrial uh, development city uh, in, in, in China during that time. From the 1960s and the 70s, uh, China-Russian relationship become a problem, and the Chairman Mao was trying to promote his uh, development model, and he tried to promote urban-rural integrations with a lot of emphasis in the rural area rather than in the cities. So this period we can refer it as an anti-urban or under-urbanization period, which is a distinctive moist model. And from 1980 onward, Chairman Mao died in 1976, and the country gradually embarked on the modernization and economic reform period with Deng Xiaoping in power. So the special economic zones, economic reforms all started in the 1980s. And Shenzhen is one of the best examples of that period. So the 1980s, we can think it's a reform period, trying to find out what the best model. From 1990s onward, 
China basically go through toward a marketization, privatization process. And the market has been given a much stronger role to play. And so this period, when the market is in major play and the regional policies was pursued in the past, doesn't work. For example, the inland areas don't have the advantage of integration with global economy, uh, international trade. So the coastal areas, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Fujian, all those places become the much more important urban center urbanization areas. So this we could refer it as a new liberal market approach period. From 2010, and China began to emphasize about city regions. When many of the cities become much bigger, cities begin to merge in, particularly in Peel River Delta region, and also the Yangtze River Delta region are around Shanghai. And so city regions, urban clusters, urban networks become the major uh, policy uh, vehicles and academic research folks. So if you're doing geography or planning, and so how to plan a city region and the how to do urban cluster, it's another area of uh, discussion. And also during this period under President Xi Jinping's leadership, we began to emphasize the urban rural integration as well. So this period could be referred as a new style urbanization, high quality urban development. You will see from Shenzhen what I mean. And also uh, emphasizing more regional balanced approaches and not put everything in one particular region, but try to spread, uh, spread out into the country again, and particularly try to bring up the rural areas. So this is the overall a policy shift in China in relation to city urban urban development. I can try it. So on the urbanization level, particularly in population terms, in 1980, China only have less than 20% of people classified as urban. And it's urbanization rate increased gradually year by year. And by year 2019, and 60% of the people living in urban areas. But you probably know that in China, they have this Hukou system. The people are registered either as urban or as rural. Rural people go to the city to work they are referred as migrant. So if, if you just think the registered urban population is less than half of the total population, 44.4% in 2019. But there was 236 million people from other areas come to the city to work, but they don't, don't have the local hukou. So they were referred as a migrant. And in 2020, the new census data was published last week. And I just find out that the China, uh, the China's urban population have increased from 60% to <clears throat> nearly 64%. So the, the country also expects urbanization to continue and they hope to reach about 75% of population living in urban areas by the year 2020, <clears throat> which is more, like, more or less about one year, a 1% 1 shift from rural to urban and over this period. If you want to have an example, Beijing probably is one of the examples. Uh, Beijing in 1980 only have 5.6 million population. And by 2000, we got 13 million. And by 2010, it's 19.6 million. You can see that since 1910, 
the Beijing's population growth slowed down a bit. Uh, by 2020, it's only 21%, uh, 21 million. One of the reasons is China still have quite strong control through the Hukou system. And Beijing is one of the places most people want to go, but the government don't to give them the Hukou. So it's a very strong population movement control in Beijing. And so that's why Beijing's population grew slower. And in the last several years, they tried to clean up some of the poor areas in the city, which actually destroyed many of the lower income people's living areas. Many people left to Beijing. So Beijing's population uh, grew slower. If you look at Shanghai and Shenzhen, you see similar trend. Shenzhen probably is a different picture. And China is quite large. It's all divided into provinces. And the province was subdivided into counties, I think. So the cities are closely related to the administrative hierarchy. In each of the administrative area, for example, in each province, you get a provincial capital, which is normally as large as the city. And in each county, you got a county town, which is normally large as the city. So because that the kind of linkages, you can see different tiers of a city in China. The tier one would be include Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and the Shenzhen. And the tier two includes some provincial capitals and so forth. So the, there is a hierarchical urban system in China. <clears throat> the general trend since 1980, after Chen Mao died, it's urbanization. And in the urbanization process, the general trend is larger city urbanizer, uh, urbanized faster. So the larger city grew faster. And for example, you can see that uh, for cities over 4 million population in the year, in the year, sorry, I tried to get this. And in 2006, there's only 11 cities over 4 million. And by 2011, 13 cities over 4 million. And 2020, I can't see that, 26, 17 cities over 4 million. But if you end up the over 1 million, you can see that it's quite a large number of people, uh, cities are over 1 million in China. And this is one of my earlier publications to give you a general model of the urban expansion in China. And the middle part, it's the 1949, pre-1949 traditional city. No industry, mainly administrative with some local shopping trade uh, facilities. And there's a pink area, it's the 1949 to 1980, <clears throat> under the socialist model, cities were built with work unit, factories, universities, and enterprises. So each is a work unit within the planned city. And from 1980 onwards, we have a market-driven urbanization. Uh, housing estate, special economic areas, uh, new towns, uh, urban villages are all within this new area of development. Airports. So the city, this is a general model, but if you go there, you can see that uh, a lot of new housing estate was built since the 1980s. In each city, you have over probably a couple thousand of a housing estate. Some is huge, very large ones. Some probably only one or two buildings. And in the urbanization process, the government played a quite important role and started with a special economic zone. It's a government policy initiative. They mark this land, say this will be a special area and 
country uh, investment from foreign countries, whether you're from capitalist or socialist or market, doesn't matter that much when you are coming to the socialist China. So that is the so-called special economic zoom. Try to test the market economy approach, Shenzhen was the first one. And from 1990 onward, they expand that kind of market approach toward other cities. So this was the so-called open cities approach. Several major cities were selected. Say the whole city is an experiment area. We can adopt market approaches. And from the 2000 onward, all the cities become uh, areas which, which can follow the uh, market development model. But I'm um, emphasizing the market, but you can see from the development part, new suburban towns, university towns, cultural district, international conference centers, new government headquarters, redevelopment historical sites, and also various sports facilities. A lot of public works are concentrated in those areas, which become the focus point. Uh, beside it, you see many new housing estates are developed. So the, the government played a quite important, strong role in leading the development in different part of the areas with the market to follow to provide housing and housing estates. So this is a, the, what urbanization in China means. The Chinese society was traditionally organizing the provinces, county, townships, villages. And through the urbanization, you will see cities, urban districts, jiedou, street committees, and the neighborhood communities. So in social organization structure, and the four tier rural based society is transformed into a tiered hierarchical management system in the cities as well. And this is one of the quite important features. And we've done the field work in the project in China, and all the neighborhood have quite strong neighborhood committee and tree management systems. That is a, a broader picture about what happened in China. And that, now let's move on to uh, Shenzhen. Shenzhen, I mentioned, is a special economic zone. Where is a Shenzhen? This is Hong Kong. This part is Hong Kong. And that is the Shenzhen. At Shenzhen, actually, the whole area includes this quite large area. So, so Shenzhen's city. Shenzhen originally is a rural county town and called the Baoan, only have about half a million population, and in, mainly in the small scatter, scattered townships. And the Shenzhen, because it's next door to Hong Kong, lost a lot of population during the 1960s and the 70s. Where the young people went, they all, some of them swimmed over to Hong Kong. And so they went to Hong Kong to work. But during the 1960s, 70s, Hong Kong was under British control. The border is quite like a dead line, and not many people can cross it. But the open water allow many of people to swim over. So in the 1980s, China say, well, why we don't do a special economic zone beside Hong Kong. Try to let Hong Kong do the investment and then try to develop the industries in this area and apply the market economic principles. So that's why it's called a special. And the initial development is quite near to the Hong Kong border. This was the initial very first simple planning and drawing to say, well, let's do a climate zone here, and this will be an area. And this is Hong Kong, it's quite small. And traditional architecture in the area is traditional rural, Chinese traditional area like, these are the older houses. When I was doing the study, we find some of this still around. So the main policy was flexible economic policy. 
and the tax advantages and allow foreign companies to come to this area to do investment, set up factories and manufacture stuff. But it's mainly for the international market as well. And special visa residence status was given to the foreigners or the people from Hong Kong. I said many uh, young people was, went to Hong Kong in the 1960s and 70s. By 1990s, many of them become quite successful. They have become businessmen in Hong Kong. So the initial idea to set up Shenzhen as a special economic zone is trying to attract the people who went to Hong Kong to bring the investment back to Shenzhen to develop them home comes. So that was also one of the reasons for the Shenzhen Special Economic Zone was set up. So the basic idea is the advantage of the location next door to Hong Kong. And also there's plenty of land. Hong Kong was quite tight with land, very crowded and the industrial land use, it's very difficult. So Shenzhen have plenty of agricultural land could be used. And special development tax policies was allowed by the central government. And also laborers in Shenzhen areas is plenty, but more importantly, Shenzhen could accept migrants from many other parts of China. So cheap labor, cheap land, advantages location, special policies and tax allurance, plus investment from Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Singapore, they all started this quite uh, dramatic development of Shenzhen. The initial products of industrialization is selling towards the international market. So you can see this whole process, why Shenzhen become the so-called word factory 20, 30 years later. The whole process was, was designed to do that. So dramatic economic growth during this period and the salary increased, attract a lot of migrants in those areas and the GDP growth of the city uh, make sure the city expands quite fast as well. In population terms, I mentioned the initial population is very small. In 1980, there's only 30, there's 332,000 population in Shenzhen. By 2019, 30 million people living in this same area. And I mentioned about the Hukou differences. Four million, it's the local Hukou holders. So, so those people went migrant to there and the government transferred them into local Hukou. But more importantly, eight million of people in 2019 still does not have the local Hukou, but they work in Shenzhen. So the migrant population is 63%. It began to decline. You can see the highest we see in the 2007, uh, 2007, 75% of people in Shenzhen migrate. Uh, to the new population published last week, Shenzhen now have 17 million people in the same area and it grew from 10 million to 17 million over the 10 year census period. And the, the reason of the growth is, you probably noticed that yesterday, China changed the family planning policy yesterday. They allow all the families to have three children now. And two years ago, there was only, uh, uh, four years ago, there's only one child policy. In 2016, they say, well, each family can have two child. But because a new census shows China's population grew quite slow, and to the age of the population is too large. So they changed the family planning policy yesterday, and all the families can have three children. But many people think that probably is a bit too late. Uh, when the family uh, 
country become urbanized, people become richer, they tend to have less family, less children. And you are all probably interested about land use planning. Uh, this is it, Shenzhen's territory. And originally it's a county, uh, the, the Boan County is there. All this area is a rural area. And the initial Shenzhen development is this part and trying to attract investment from Hong Kong. This is Hong Kong. And that is the very early 1996 to 2010 plan. And that is the, yeah, this is, this is, the, this is the, the 1996 land use plan. I can't find the original 1980 plan. So this, you can assume that was 1980s rough idea. And this is the 1996 to 2010 plan. You can see development expand to all the other part of this territory. And this is the 2010 and 2020 plan. So because of development very fast, in China, normally uh, master plans cover a period of 20 years. But in Shenzhen, it's only cover about 10 years. And every five years, they might do a review as well. And you can see still there's a lot of green space inside the Shenzhen territory, but they are all mountains or hills, which is not suitable for development. Every piece of a flat area now have been developed. And the dark color is industrial land use. The yellow color is normally residential land use. You can see industry and the residential, it is still quite dominant area. And the other thing is because industrialization becomes so important, there's several ports was developed here. And this is a major container port and takes all the products out from Shenzhen to the other part of the world. There's another port here, this side, and also there's an airport. So I mentioned to the, the government-led development, large infrastructure, administrative quarters, commercial streets, those are the planned uh, urban development in Shenzhen. And apart from that, you also have other uh, flagship uh, development. And this, oh, sorry. This is the left hand picture. It's the Beijing University's Shenzhen Graduate School. Because Shenzhen is a new city, uh, it lacks, lacks a lot of uh, facilities like education facilities, sports facilities, or cultural facilities. The government tried to make the city work. They built a lot of these new facilities, but the university don't grow overnight. So the city encouraged the national big universities come to set up campus in Shenzhen. Beijing University, Tsinghua University, Harbin Industrial Technology University, they all set up graduate school in Shenzhen. And when I do my field work and studies, I stayed in the Beijing University campus most of the time. And also, high rise property housing development in Shenzhen. Shenzhen's property price increased dramatically over the last 30 years. And about 20 years ago, it was quite easy for people from Hong Kong to cross the border, come to Shenzhen and to buy a flat in Shenzhen. And after about 20, 30 year development, now that become more or less impossible. And because the Shenzhen's house price grew so fast and many Hong Kong's ordinary people find it difficult to afford to buy Shenzhen's properties. Many of the property, uh, the people with a lot of property in Shenzhen, the, the reverse can happen. They could invest in, in, in buying properties in Hong Kong's 
residential market. So that is the formal development. But I mentioned the informal urban villages have played a quite important role in Shenzhen. And this is the original Shenzhen area. You can see that the blue areas are the villages, original villages. And when the city began to grow, they allow the city to stay, the, the, the villages to stay, but the government built a new infrastructure and other new areas in the open space. So that you can see how important the urban village in locational terms, in the scale of land use terms in the city. And the original villages looks like this, and the lower right hand color, you can see that the photo was taken in 2006. But that style is 1980s style. And the other slate of the slope for that was very traditional style. The traditional village, urban villages are like that. But the urban villages was allowed to stay, but it does not stay stable. The villagers, because they lost the land to produce crops, they began to collect the rent. When they collect the more rent, they rebuild their houses. And so this is what you see in most of the Shenzhen's urban villages. The original houses is disappeared. And on the same side, they built this very small square building, but very high uh, with five story, six story. The highest I saw was 12 story built by the family because they're collecting rent. Because the village's locations are so good, they just keep collecting rent renew the houses, create more spaces for renting. And you can see the village development style. Some villages draw up maps, say, well, let's do redevelop our village. And you can see the, 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 the plan is very simple. Just the street and the plot, and each family have a plot, you can rebuild your house on it. How big are the urban villages? By how many migrant workers they accommodated? It is quite important to see that. Uh, this table I collected was in 19, uh, 2003. The data was collected in 2003. There's four villages here. You can see that. And the first village called Shamelin. And the original household to have about, the originally only have 572 household and 1,376 residents. But how many number of migrant work, workers they accommodated? 61,800. So it's equivalent that each household provides houses that were over 100 migrant workers. So that is the scale of the rental housing in the private sector. And these are some of the, the poor living conditions inside the urban villages. And the outside looks interesting, but inside, because the people are quite low income, many people share in rooms and this the top one, you can see the, share, the, the little room be shared by six people. They will go to shift and the, 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 the ground floor bed, people are still sleeping in it. And the top up bed, people goes to work. So the living condition, it is quite tight in some of the buildings, but most of a reasonable living condition for the industrial workers. And the urban villages also accommodate a lot of factories. Those buildings, you can see the left hand side and the top right, they are factories, short workshops, and not necessarily one factory or one building. One building can accommodate several enterprises. And the lower right hand side, you can see the first three floor is workshops but the upper several floors are the workers' living quarters. 
So the urban village, when they become rich, they also try to preserve their cultural heritages, ancestors to temples, or build a fancy village gate to mark, this is my village. Once you get into this gate, you're in that village. And the urban villages also provide a lot of market because the population density is so high and commercial activity, marketing, food stores is quite popular inside urban villages as well. So you can see the urban villages was less well organized, poor conditions, but why it happened? Because many people benefited from it. The first group, benefit from the urban villages are the original and land owners. They were the local farmers, but they can't farm. They need to have a life. They need to have the income. So they build rent houses. That become a new way of life. The second group of benefit is the migrants. When they come to city to work in such a large scale, large groups, it's unrealistic for them to go to the commercial housing estate to rent the new commercially built houses. As I mentioned, the house price is well beyond any migrant workers renting. Never think about buying one. And so the urban village provide a cheap accommodation in reasonable good location for those people to work. And also the government also, I think it benefits quite a lot. When the country goes industrialization, housing is always a problem and a hold to accommodate the lower income and the, the, the blue collar workers, and it's a challenge. If you build a public housing like UK built a council housing, the scale of requirement and the speed of requirement, it will be impossible to meet the big demand. But the government just take a hand off approach, the local villages and the coming migrants work together, created this Shenzhen's special urban village phenomena. And this was a diagram I published some time ago. And in, when the city is small, urban villages could be inside the city center, but always a, a group of villages around the city gradually will be, be, be turned into urban villages. And when city grew bigger, some have been absorbed into the city, but other new villages become urban villages. So this kind of waves of urban village, it is quite important phenomena in the whole Pure River Delta region development, not just about Shenzhen. And so we can see there's two ways of urbanization in Shenzhen. One is the planned government-led urbanization. Fresh agricultural land can be earmarked, infrastructure can be laid out, new planned universities, offices, streets was planned. So that is the planned urbanization. But there is an unplanned or less rigidly planned urbanization. It's the urban villages. They turned the traditional villages into an urban community. And the people adapt into the urban way of life and create a life for themselves. So this two process work together, actually created the Shenzhen city. And a city grew from half a million population to 17, 17 million in a short period of 40 years. And this is, a, I think this is a quite important dual track urbanization model. And probably when everywhere urbanized, we need to allow this kind of changes. So that is the earliest stage of urbanization, but Shenzhen faced a lot of new problems. Because the city have more or less urbanized, they want to update. Cities from industrial city become a post-industrial city. They want a city become a leader in the country rather than a manufacturing uh, uh, location. They want a high-tech development because that's the next door of Hong Kong. 
And so the population, the housing, the urban village is not matching with that kind of ambition. So how to upgrade the population's quality by education, by recruit high standard, well educated professionals? How to get this lower quality working class people out of the city, out of the urban villages? How to get rid of some of the urban villages and to create that, to use that land for modern development. So this is the, the, the challenge they face at the moment. Particularly, you might hear this idea of the Dawan district, Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, along that Hill River Delta region. They call the Dawan region. They want the Dawan region to be the next major international leadership of a core of urban areas. So Shenzhen have to play a leading role there. But that means the urban village setting, lower income migrant industrial factories is not matching with that ambition. So urban redevelopment, renewal, is another way of development. And so there are already some urban village redevelopment process. This village I visited about six years ago. And the left-hand side, you can see, is that so-called family-based high-rise area. And the village redeveloped another area beside the old village and created this new housing estate. All the village, so all residents, 800 households, move into this area. But the migrant workers were still left there for that time. I think when the city wants to redevelop, they might demolish all these old, older urban villages and they use the land for other purposes. So the problem is the traditional local farmer have become the new urban residents in this high rise, beautiful housing estate. But the migrant workers was left in the old area. They might need to find a new ways of life. Someone else, or somewhere in the city as well. So this is the quite important the differences I was thinking about China and uh, the other developing countries, particularly Indian, maybe similar to Bangladesh as well. In China, and we can see two ways of dual track urbanization, but China tended to demolish the urban villages, to eliminate the informal sectors, and to let the formal sector become the main dominant city for the future. So the city become a uniform, modern, but high rise, high density, very simple, boring urban landscape. But in India, we can see that the informal sector is quite large, the formal sector grew slowly, but there's no major policy yet to get rid of the informal sector. I think the city is more integrated, diversified, culturally more sensitive to tradition and to the local uh, ideas. So I think that was about the Shenzhen. And this is the last slide I'd like to show. It's if you're interested about China's urbanization, urban planning ideas. The, in the last couple of years, since it's 2017, and China have started another new experimental city, which is called Xiong'an, new district. This is located outside of Beijing now. And they want to create this high quality urbanization and high tech and a smart city and they try to avoid the urban village stage of a development and they try to redevelop all the villages with one goal, clear the land and develop this new area there. So if you're interested about that, you probably can find more information on that. So I think that just give you overall 
I think I'll probably run over a bit and hope it's useful for, for you. And I'm quite happy to, to answer some questions. Yeah.